Animation is nothing new, and certainly clay has been around since well before the wagon trains. But clay animation? Well, that's something fairly new. Portland filmmaker Will Vinton has been doing clay animation since 1973, when he and sculptor Bob Gardner created their first theatrical short film, The Eight Minute Closed Mondays. The film took about 12,000 single frame movements and 13 months to complete, but the diligence paid off. Closed Mondays won an Academy Award. A trade name for this special brand of animation was essential. Vinton decided to call it... That's Three Donation. Meet Will Vinton. He'll tell you what Three Donation is all about. Okay, Three Donation is uh, a process of play animation. Comes from, the word comes from three dimensional play animation. Um, that uh, we've used the name essentially to sort of describe our particular kind of clay animation and set it somehow uh, apart from maybe perhaps other people's. Clay animation is an old technique. Um, you know, we didn't invent it by any means. It's a really old technique. Kids have done it forever, you know, for as a classroom tool, uh, animation uh, learning technique a lot, and there's some real classics of clay animation around. But we've taken on uh, doing things in some more realistic manner, uh, using full color um, characters and so forth, trying to do some really fine detail, um, playing with metamorphosis kinds of things, um, a lot using, using the, the medium in a lot more an expressive way to do stories and things like that. And so really it's just it's just a name that we've uh, put on it, trying to say that uh, you know maybe this is something a little bit different than this. It came about uh, initially, started the process of play animation actually when I was in college. Uh, I started with three-dimensional kinds of animation. Uh, we studied architecture in school and we moved models and things, cars through, through buildings and, and did animation of models, architectural models, as a as a means to study um, how a, a building might look in reality. You know, how a model might look in reality using a camera to actually animate things moving through it. So I, that's where I, I first did three-dimensional kinds of animation, and then uh, met up with a sculptor, Bob Gardner, in uh, in uh, Berkeley. I was down there. And uh, together we tried, experimented around with clay in particular, and trying to uh, create little film ideas with clay. Well, actually, it's then about five years lapsed after that, uh, during which time I was doing commercial filmmaking of various kinds of documentaries and some cell animated films and, and so forth and a few kinds of small kinds of uh, commercial uh, three-dimensional animation things, moving objects and so forth. As we perfect the techniques, uh, I think a lot of the things become, a lot of the techniques become less of a challenge, but we keep creating new things, new problems all the time. And that's sort of, uh, sort of the fun of it. It's uh, um, every film we do, we try and invent uh, camera moves, for example, that are things we've, we've never done before that are some kind of require some, some kind of crazy camera rig to carry the camera off and, and uh, make it seem very very much like uh, very light and, and not restricted uh, to kind of tabletop you know, model setups, camera sitting on a tripod. You want to try and create the illusion that that it's like a live action production in the sense that you've got uh, helicopters available to you and big cranes and dollying shots and all those kinds of things. And uh, as I said before, I like like the idea of kind of playing with uh, the conventions of live action production um, and using those as a kind of uh, tool to create moods, to create 
um, thing. But in other words, one way of looking sort of, sort of off the subject maybe, but live action productions, we're so used to seeing them and the conventions that they use for editing and cutting, going to close-ups, doing camera shot, mm -hmm. camera moves and so forth. Um, we see those and they, those begin to mean certain things. They're symbolic sort of things. And by using the same techniques in the clay animation, the same moves, the same kind of cutting techniques, mm -hmm. you're, you're borrowing on those experiences, those moves that, you, that uh, live action producers have created and uh, imparting them onto the, the clay characters. We don't really create totally new techniques. Nothing that we've done or anybody's done, including the people that did Star Wars and and uh, I mean, there's hardly anything new under the sun. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that uh, for everything that uh, we could say we've we've done, it's new. It's new to us. Mm -hmm. New experiences for us, for sure. But there are definitely um, those things have been done, pioneered before us. Um, but for our own sake, we we uh, um, are, as I said before, constantly elaborating on a repertory of kinds of camera moves and camera shots and the way we can move it around. We're all elaborating on the kinds of armatures that we use for characters and for uh, objects to support them, give the clay uh, strength and so forth. We're elaborating, as I said, on, on uh, ways to make things fly and, and uh, ways of matting, using optical effects mm -hmm. to uh, to combine live action scenes and clay scenes together in the same frame. Um, um, we've tried, we're constantly trying new and different ways too of, of um, the use of uh, a reference film as, as guiding the animation, studying motion of uh, real people and so forth as a guide for uh, the animation motion. And um, so there's a whole lot of things, but like I said, none of those things are brand new. Vinton's company, Will Vinton Productions, has produced several clay animated films since Closed Mondays, including the nine-minute Mountain Music and a half-hour television special, Martin the Cobbler, both recipients of numerous major festival awards. Will Vinton Productions is currently working on a second half-hour TV special, Rip Van Winkle, adapted from the story by Washington Irving. Some personnel changes over the years have brought a mainstay to the company in former architects Barry Bruce and Don Merkt. Bruce and Merkt split and share the full-time duties of sculpting, set building, and animating. Well, there's a lot of different things that's pretty neat. It's pretty nice to actually be able to, uh, to do some kind of creative work in uh, and really be able to make a living at it. There's a lot of people I know that are really creative and do really good things, but have a heck of a time doing, you know, really making a living at it. But I, for me right now, I think the neatest thing about the clay animation is that it, you can get uh, eight hours a day experience of constant sculpting, which is pretty outrageous. I think it's a really good experience. I think it's just uh, the excitement of a new medium they haven't worked in before. I think I compare it with what my pet, you know, like we talked about before, from past experiences with, with working in just cardboard and, and architecture and, and wood and clay is is so plastic that you can just you can make it look like anything and and you can do really fanciful things with it. And, uh, you don't have the structural problems you have with, with other things. So it's. It seems like it's just a, a medium that has a lot of potential, and more potential than limits, I think. The remainder of the crew involved in the production of three dimension films with Vinton consists primarily of part-time and contract talent. Musicians Bill Scream... Oh, hi, America! ...and Paul Jameson. There's a bee there, and I was gonna... I felt something. Uh, ...writer, and Vinton's wife, Susan Shadburn and a Whitman sampler of other uh, animated characters. <laughs> so, how is a three-dimension film assembled? 
Do they just start shooting and hope for the best? Well, not quite. First, a story must be chosen. Then the story must be adapted to appeal to a specific or broad target audience, depending upon the intended market. Then, the camera moves are worked out and drawn into a storyboard form with the shooting script. Next, the voice talents are chosen, then filmed and recorded simultaneously in the sound studio. The actors are filmed to provide a live action reference upon which to base every movement, gesture, and expression on their clay counterparts. Then the characters are created and the sets are built. The sets are almost entirely clay-covered wood and different mesh gauges of cage wire, with a few lichens stuck here and there to simulate trees. The characters are sculpted over steel and brass armatures with movable joints, as seen in this time-lapse excerpt from Will Vinton Productions' Three Dimension Documentary. They do resemble real people. I mean, hopefully, they resemble re real people. They're supposed to look like real people. They, um, but oftentimes, um, for a particular character, you know, you'll take somebody that you know that seems like uh, they sort of fit the uh, kind of uh, characterization that this person's supposed to do, and that helps in, in anime. Um, you have a, a, a sense, you know, somebody that. that reacts in certain ways, or you've seen people do that, and so you naturally copy them, sort of. And sometimes you copy them very blatantly. Uh, in mountain music, uh, that's probably the most blatant example, we copied uh, Billy Scream uh, as the drummer in, in mountain music, and we also copied Paul James and his partner, who, who both created the music of mountain music, uh, as the guitar player. and. Uh, how the woman was, uh, was uh, sort of made up, uh, although she looks like other musicians sort of made up. Vinton has utilized the talents of musicians Scream and Jameson since the inception of Three Dimension, and he's put them to work once again on Rip Van Winkle, this time with lyrical assistance by Susan Shadburn. An accomplished musician herself, Susan also scored the original melody lines for Rip's theme songs. Keyboard man Scream and guitarist Jameson are responsible for the arranging and orchestration. They take their profession pretty seriously, as you might guess. I met Will in uh, the back of a car. I've met, you know, I've met a lot of people in the back of a car, and I don't mean to, to uh, uh, dilute our relationship in any way, but um, uh, we were, I was much younger <laughs> and uh, a foolish youngster at best. No, I was only about, let's see, I was about six or seven, and he and I were just playing in the back of this car because his father was a car dealer. And and we met each other there. I'm sure this is... This is oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is prophecy we're talking about now. Fulfilled. Oh, this is... Anyway, I think this was told about a long time ago. Uh, but we met, and uh, he went to a different grade school, but then eventually we went to the same junior high <coughs> and high school, and... Uh, uh, he was uh, he he was in sports and football and he had a I remember he had a camera and we used to take these funny little movies but I never considered him really a cinematographer really um, and uh, then after he came back from Berkeley going to college down there he uh, he was all of a sudden he was a filmmaker I think he had a transplant may have. Uh, and uh, so I and I had been I had turned so-called professional by then too and I was in Seattle and so we started doing a few things then and that in fact where the music from Closed Mondays came from was my time in Seattle I started uh, uh, just playing in bands uh, when I was in high school uh, learned Louie Louie was my first song and I learned how to play seven chords in my first band didn't learn how to play minors in my first band. So that was a major band. It probably. was a major band. Now the second band, when the uh, Animals came along with uh, House of the Rising Sun, you uh, had yes. to learn minors. Yeah, that was my first, first that, tune. In I fact, learned. that was the first okay. tune. And so we go to Paul. That, what was the first song you ever learned, Paul? Uh, the first song. Thank you. Are you interviewing <laughs> me now, or the first song? I'll tell him in my own way. The first song I ever learned was also uh, House of the Rising Sun, and that had several minor chords in it. Um, that was, in fact, my first guitar. 
experience, we call it, I guess. And that was also coming from playing in bands. Uh, I had four brothers and sisters who all played instruments. And so I picked up guitar from my brother. Did you ever have show and tell in uh, grade school? Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Oh, okay, well. Uh. <laughs> no, so we used to, in grade school, used to have, like, every Friday you'd get up and, you know, in, like, first grade, you'd get up in front of the class and they'd say, what can you do? So I had to do something. So I'd sing. And uh, pretty soon people would say, why don't you hey. play an instrument in lieu of singing? You ought to be a star. Because uh, you don't sing very well. <laughs> <laughs> so I got guitar, started playing guitar for show and tell. They let me do that. I'd like to interject here, uh, incidentally, just for the record, <coughs> that when I was in high school, my uh, choir teacher kicked me out of choir because he said I didn't know how to sing. And also, this at a similar time, my music teacher, who taught me piano, told me that I was the worst composer she'd ever heard of. And I'd just like to put that on the record. And, and he's living proof of that <laughs> today, in fact. <laughs> This is where we record a lot of the music for Will's films. Uh, uh, we do we do our, some of our work on the four track, as you see here. I, can you see that in fact, America? And um, we uh, uh, have a uh, two track that we mix down to, and we have all kinds of recording equipment here, monitor, amp, all the usual stuff that every studio has. The only thing that we don't have that most studios have is size. As you can see, I can practically reach one wall to the next, and we work in a small space. This is because I'm small. We have, uh, would you like to come into the other room, uh, America, and we'll, <laughs> we'll show you where some other things happen. Now, this is where we play... That's right, America. I pl I actually play the piano on this stuff. Now, uh, in fact, right here on this very piano, you've heard all the tracks from Martin the Cobbler, uh, many of the pieces from Rip Van Winkle. Uh, um, we put all the, all of our sound effects from um, uh, the film Three Dimension. All those were done here. Um, I've sat in this corner many a time thinking about a lot of things that have eventually gone on television and radio, and you're in fact seeing the very spot that a lot of things happen. So, I thought I'd just, uh, I got a little song here I'd like to play you. <laughs> Is the tape about ready to run out? Or? You will, you will edit this for me, won't you? Yes. Thank you. I only know one song, oh, excuse me, I only know one song because that's the only one I'm working on right now, but, uh... heard about some film industry drawbacks, budget entanglements, talent feuds, screenplay rights, and the like. But what could possibly go wrong with a slow-paced, controlled process like three dimension? Sometimes it's very difficult to do exactly what you want to do, um, like you can in cell animation, because play animation, play has weight. It has to be sitting on something or supported by something, whereas a cell animated character can fly and can be up off the ground very easily. It just has to be drawn up off the ground. That's all there is to it. Uh, clay objects and characters and so forth have to be somehow held uh, up uh, to do things. So it's hard for them to run and jump and fly and, and do those kinds of lively things. And uh, we spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out tricks to, to make that work and make it work better and smoother. We're having problems with Rip Van Winkle in 
the biggest problem right now is that we're switching all over entirely to 35 millimeter for our shooting, and um, that's merely that's really just a technical problem. Uh, it's no small problem for sure because it's not just though we've got the necessary equipment and so forth and we're geared up. Uh, we're, we aren't exactly in a film capital of the world in Portland and uh, it's pretty tough to find the services that we need here. In fact, there, there are not services in Portland for 35mm, so we have to do our, send most of our processing and so forth. Prints have to be made and so forth in LA or, or Seattle. Uh, some things can be done in Seattle. So that's been a real thorn in the side of Group Ben and Winkle so far, but I'm very pleased with, with the results of Group Ben and Winkle, and I think it, it artistically um, is uh, really superior to just about anything we've done, I think, um, and I'm real, real happy about that. So um, I, the, the technical problems will get ironed out soon, things will go smoother, I'm sure. Contract deadlines are always a problem, <laughs> but uh, we haven't had too much problem with it. Fortunately, we've uh, we've also worked with people, producers that uh, have been a little bit flexible, but uh, we've we've come in come in on time pretty well. The whole problem, though, with getting one of these productions done on time is that every project is a brand new problem. Is a brand new Thing. Um, it requires, you know, its own all brand new solutions in a lot of cases, and it's very difficult in the beginning of a project to foresee just exactly how much time that's going to take. Um, that's not true in some other kinds of production, where there's a lot of uh, a lot of things have been done before like it, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a pretty clear uh, you have a pretty clear image of just exactly how much time it's going to take realistically. Um, but I, so in that regard, I'd say we've really done pretty well in terms of uh, coming in on time. Uh, we were a little bit over time with Martin the Cobbler, and we're going to be a little bit over time maybe with Rip Van Winkle, but uh, only probably 10% over. In general, I don't think there are too many problems with <laughs> it, we probably wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> Sometimes things start slowly getting out of control, and... Uh, and we, I think we don't say we don't say anything, but sometimes it's real tense, and you can tell that Barry and I never fight. See, this is this is thing, but we could. There's sometimes when we probably could, and uh, yeah. I don't know if I want to talk about this. <laughs> well, I think what it does to you mainly is it gets you real, real anxious toward the end of the thing. It, you get tired, but you get tired doing anything for a long stretch of time. But when you get all that camera in the film, for me, and I know all that, that or all the film in the camera, how does that work? <laughs> That's what Don handles that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about working eight hours a day. It really helps to be in a mood. Some days it goes a lot easier than other days, and it just flows right along. But but you got to do something every day. I mean. You can't just come in and say, well, today I don't feel like it, so I'm not going to do it. Some days it flows better than others, and some days it doesn't, but you can always make something happen. There are more problems than anything I can think of putting music on, I think, is trying to... It's it. When we first... Um, when we first get together and start working on it, we're working on just from scripts, usually not even the final script, and so it's real rough ideas that go back and forth. But by the time we get to a final script, then we're pretty heavy into it. Uh, we very seldom see some film unless we see the uh, the uh, reference film. Um, but usually we would like to have it sync really you know, in every possible way it can. And every second the music's doing something and, and then the the action does something and be very close in sync with what's going on but you don't get a chance to do that sometimes but the, so the problem is is how much can you do and still get it done in a reasonable amount of time and still make it sound right you're usually when you start out you think you have a, a really good idea of what you're gonna do you know in other words you say that this is gonna turn out great I've got it all in my mind here you know this is before anything's laid down 
and about halfway through you start getting kind of a panicky feeling, oh, he's going to cut this and he's going to cut that, and this song isn't going to make any sense anymore, and my, you know, the best intro that I've written, you know, my whole career is going to be cut out, and and then at the end when you get the emotional, uh, there's a real emotional high of seeing the thing, and nine times out of ten it turns out a lot better than you thought it would then, and you go, oh, jeez, I'm a genius, you know. I did it right, you know, but there's there's a lot of there's a lot of, uh, of worry involved in you know in in the middle of it when you're right in the midst of it as to whether it's all going to come together or whether it's just going to make no sense at all. Does three dimension hold a guaranteed position in the field along with its already well-established cell animation competitors? Disney, after all, has been in the cartoon business longer than most of us remember. Yeah, I think we're we're in competition with cell animation. Um, the uh, clay animation does some things much better than cell animation. Cell animation does an awful lot of things better than, than uh, clay animation. So you have to be very careful about using using all, any of those mediums. I think in in ways that uh, work well with that particular with that particular medium. I've done a number of uh, small time commercials in cell animation and. Uh, Limited cell animation, uh, sort of product uh, films, and kinds of documentary things. But uh, my experience in cell animation is fairly limited, actually. I had a lot more experience probably in, in three dimensional types of animation. Which do you prefer, should I ask? <laughs> well, I definitely prefer three dimensional animation, in particular the clay animation, three dimension that we do. Uh, it's uh, it's a lot more exciting to me. Uh, there's a lot of things that, uh, for one thing, you're you're really working in, in real space. You're working with real characters in real space. You they have these problems of weight and so forth. They take on personalities. You're building sets around them and so forth, and moving cameras through them. And uh, you, when you shoot, every scene you shoot is like shooting live action in the sense that you're performing in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. The characters are performing in front of the camera. It's not until you get the footage back that you know what it's going to look like exactly. And that's, a, that's a sort of an exciting thing. It's also a very uh, tenuous thing and it's scary sometimes. And, you know, we, we get very nervous about viewing the rushes when they come back. But uh, it's all that, that makes it fun. And it's, uh, the whole long, long process of shooting is enjoyable because it's that kind of that kind of experience, whereas cell animation, after a fashion, once you get the cells and so forth designed, then it's just it takes a factory of people, or else somebody who just wants who spends an incredible amount of time just grinding out the cells and making them come to life uh, on film. For all its painfully slow, tedious hours upon hours of frame by frame shooting, sculpting, shooting, sculpting there must be some reward for the practitioners of this medium which would drive any normal person insane. I'd say the most, the greatest satisfaction in doing these three dimension productions is really the, uh, that of completing a project. The projects are very long, involved, um, detailed, they have a lot of elements that, that have to come together, music and voice talent, voices and, and uh, the editing and technical problems, artistic problems. And it's uh, it's like a big you know, it's a big problem. And the, the whole process of making films like this is, is a process of problem solving and coming finding a solution that works that makes things move and all that sort of thing. What is the driving force behind Will Vinton and his slaves uh, cohorts? Well, that we may never know. But perhaps even in three dimension, the end justifies the means, or is it? The means justify the end? Outrageous. <laughs>